I don't even know how to start these things. I have just like, wait a second. Uh, we need to like come up with a like, oh, hi, I'm Adrian Fonseca. And you're the tech guy here. You're the one who inter- interviews every. Welcome to Catholic Conversations. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. In honor of the Triduum, I have prepared a meditation on the Passion of Our Lord, derived from many saints and their meditations. In doing research for this meditation, I came across this poem from a Chinese king whose name I will not attempt to pronounce. And I would like to read it to you as it sets up the meditation nicely. When the work on the cross was accomplished, blood formed a creek. Grace from the west flowed a thousand yards deep. He stepped onto the midnight road to subject himself to four trials. Before the rooster crowed twice, betrayed thrice was he. Five hundred lashes tore every inch of his skin. Two thieves at six feet. I hang beside him. The sadness was greater than any had ever known. Seven utterings, one completed task, 10,000 spirits weep. The thing about scripture is that even though it took place 2,000 years ago, nothing has changed. We are the very people who condoned our Lord to death. We are Pontius Pilate. We are Herod. We are Judas. We are the soldiers. We are the crowds. We are the thieves. We can see ourselves throughout the gospel narrative, especially at the passion of our Lord. We are these men who condemned our Lord. For in following your own will, in your own inclinations, it is you. It is I who are the cause of his death and passion. So we focus on these characters, some of which we relate to more some of which we relate to less. We begin with Pilate. Pilate is the classic academic and politician. He was not a bad guy. His only ambition was to keep peace, not cause problems, and be successful by worldly standards. When presented with truth, he denies it. He denies him. What is truth? Is, not, is that not the calling cry of so many in our world today? So many deny truth. But what is crying out in the depths of their soul is the same statement that Pilate made. What is truth? We long for truth. We search for it day and night and not finding it, we declare that there must not be any truth. There is nothing more true than the cross. It speaks to the very depths of our soul. It declares unto us all our failings and misdeeds while presenting us with that undeserved divine mercy. We will end up like Pilate. I am innocent, he declares. He says it over and over and over again. And if he is trying, as if he is trying to convince himself. He washes his hands. And for the seventh time, he claims, I am innocent of this man's blood. I am Pilate. Often I convince myself that it is not I that crucified Christ. It was the people who came before. It was the other sinners, not I. How often do I become indifferent to my own sin? to my own faults and wickedness. We declare in the creed, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. When I read that, I read, he was crucified under me. Indifference. Indifference to sin and thus to the cross of our Lord. This is the attitude we often have. This is one heart we have in relation to the cross. Revulsion is another heart we can have in relation to the cross. Much like King Herod. Who was Herod? Herod was the functioning king of the Jews. Son of Herod the Great, the one who rebuilt the temple. He was a wicked man. He had even married his brother's wife. Our good Lord called him a fox. He was the same Herod that John the Baptist preached to, only to be beheaded. 
Many graces was given this man. Wealth, power, status, even the greatest of the prophets, the cousin of our blessed Lord, went to him to proclaim the truth. When our blessed Lord was sent to him, Herod was immediately frightened, believing our Lord to be John the Baptist risen from the dead. When he discovered just who this man was, scripture says that Herod was glad to see him. Why was he glad? Because he had heard of the great miracles he had done. He was hoping for some miracles, some signs, something to delight him. He began to question him. What did he ask? Only our Lord knows. Perhaps he asked him to turn some water into wine or multiply some loaves and fishes or raise someone from the dead. He was looking for worldly pleasures, for entertainment from our blessed Lord. What does he tell Herod? Not a word. Our Lord speaks not a word to the man, for Herod had squandered every grace he was given. He denied the very preaching of John the Baptist. Our good Lord would not give him one more sacred thing to desecrate, to cast more sin by throwing away, or worse, corrupting the graces he received. The truth is, I am Herod. How often do I come to church looking to be entertained? I look to the priest and say that homily was not very entertaining. The mass itself was not entertaining. But the mass is not entertainment. I come to God in prayer and demand miracles. I demand that he fixes my life the way I want him to. I disregard his own plan and seek what I perceive to be good. I ask for worldly things. I ask for pleasures, for success, for healing. I hardly ask to be made a saint. I hardly ask for faith, hope, and love. The very virtues we need to become saints. I take the graces I have been given and I use them for my own selfish desires. We are revolted by the very idea that God may want us to endure, to suffer for the sake of righteousness. We revolt from the cross, just as Herod did. For our next person, let us go back a little bit further to a time when everyone wanted Jesus to be the king of the Jews, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Here is when everyone loved him, when he provided a super abundance of food. Seeing a large group of them coming, asking for more, (laughs) we always want more. Isn't it curious how whenever we are satisfied, we are never satisfied for long. We always desire more. For instance, when I first got my first got my job, I was delighted to be making minimum wage. But soon I desired more. When I got my second job, which paid a wonderful $10 an hour, I was ecstatic. I was making so much more than before. I was satisfied. But soon I desired more. And I so on and so forth. And I think you can see the path that it is headed. And so too it is with everything in our life. So it was with the Jews. They had been given such a magnificent miracle. So they desired more. Our Lord would oblige. He promised a food that if eaten, you would never die. The crowd was intrigued. They told our Lord to give them this food always. His response was radical. It scandalized them. Much how much like how we are often scandalized by the cross. He said, If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life within you. Many of his disciples left him then. Not only his disciples, but even an apostle. It was then that Judas abandoned our Lord. Though Judas did not physically leave our Lord like the crowds, 
he had left him in his heart. In the depths of his heart, he declared, this is a hard saying. Who can accept this? His heart was set out of worldly pleasures. It was set for love of money. It was set to sell the Lord of the universe for 30 pieces of silver. I guess this explains why he was so upset when the woman anoints our Lord with perfumed oil. He saw things only in monetary value. He saw the price of everything in the value of nothing. He exclaimed in a distraught way, we could have sold it for 300 pieces of silver. To him, the perfumed oils were worth 10 times what our Lord was worth. How cheaply he sold divinity. As if any price could ever suffice. He understood this too. Coming back to those whom he allowed himself to be duped, he hurled the 30 pieces of silver back at them. He casted it at their feet. He cried out in agony, in despair. Yet he had no repentance. Unlike Peter, who also sold out our Lord three times, yet tradition has it that he sat and he cried and he wept. He wept so much that he had furrows in his cheeks. Yet he repented. There is so much more here to which we can compare. I want to focus on only one thing. The blessed sacrament. When we look upon our Lord's Eucharistic face, do we exclaim the profession of faith given by the one who has been branded doubting Thomas? Do we exclaim with faith, hope, and love, my Lord and my God. It was this sacrament that our Lord was telling us about. It was no longer bread and wine which he would give, but his body, blood, soul, and divinity. This is what Judas denied. Do we too deny it? If someone saw the way we treated the Eucharist, would they accuse us of worship or would they be confused of why we eat bread? There was once a woman whose son was kidnapped. Her son was kidnapped because they thought she was rich. Her family owned many businesses. In reality, she was putting on a facade. She was secretly going bankrupt and she had been playing a charade in order to keep up the appearance as if everything was fine. I guess it worked because she was targeted for ransom money. She couldn't pay, and her son was never returned to her. It was a huge sensation around the city. She would walk about town, and people would talk and whisper to one another. People were intrigued. She walked about like a mobile zoo. One day, the murmurers and whispers were too much for her. She heard a one man tell another, Did you hear about this amazing story? She turns to them with tears in her eyes and says, I want to hear an amazing story. Is this not our attitude to the cross? It is an amazing story to hear every year, but does it change us? Do we have the disposition of the mother who lived the story? In every moment of it shapes her life. Imagine the face of she whose only son was nailed to a cross and died for those who mocked him. Who, seeing the face of this mother, would not be moved to tears. The two thieves on the cross are two choices we can have at the face of the cross. We can look at the cross and say, This is not God. If you were God, save me and save yourself. We put God to the test. We say, God, give me a miracle and I will believe in you. We demand that God take us down from our crosses. For what? What will we do without our cross? We throw down our cross so we can run to our comfort, run to our sin. We tell God, 
that we would make a better God, that we could do it better. If God was real, he wouldn't let me suffer. If God was real, he would heal me. Yet God did not even do it for himself. Why? Because there is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for a friend. He laid down his life for us. May we respond like the thief on his right. He who rebuked the other thief and cried out in holy fear. Hast thou no fear of God when thou art under the same condemnation? He turns to our Lord and begs, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is the attitude we pray for. This thief who was justly punished did not ask to be taken down from the cross. He did not ask for healing, only for forgiveness. He recognized his crimes and accepted his just punishment. Our Lord's response to such faithfulness. Amen, I say to thee. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. The thief on the right remained a thief. For that day he stole salvation. We too deserve death. Deserve, deserve every sort of punishment. Yet we too can steal salvation by running to the confessional, by offering our sufferings for penance, for the conversion of poor sinners. Let us steal heaven by the grace of God, for we are owed none of it. Then there is the man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. The man had no desire to help carry the cross. The cross was thrusted upon him. For our Lord could no longer carry his cross on his own. He had been beaten, cursed, scourged, exhausted, and yet he went on. So Simon was called upon to relieve even a small amount of suffering from our Lord. He did so unwillingly. Yet in carrying the cross, he understood the beauty of it. And tradition holds that Simon converted and became a follower of Christ. His son Rufus became one of the first bishops of the church. And his son Alexander was given one of the greatest honors that the church can offer. The Red crown of martyrdom. If we only embrace our cross, we too may learn to love it, to see the beauty of it. And in carrying our cross, maybe we too can relieve a small bit of suffering from our Lord. Finally, the Blessed Mother. She was the woman whom loved him more than any other. Imagine your own mother. A mother's love is special. A mother's love runs deep. So deep that when their child is hurt in any way, she too feels the pain. A mother runs to comfort her ill child. She would do anything to relieve her child of pain. So too does our blessed mother. She who saw the face of her son and wept. She was crucified with her son on that cross. She was surrounded by people, by the beloved disciple John and the other Mary, yet she was all alone. She had compassion for her son. She felt a co-passion with her son. She hears the crowds of blasphemy, knowing that her son is the one true God. Her heart is cleaved in two. When her son is dead, she understands what really happened. The one whom she loved was no longer here. She held the lifeless body of her son in her arms and looked at the face that was once her son and her God. What she would not have given to crawl into the tomb with her son. Who could look upon the face of this woman and not weep? 
all that she loved and all that she treasured was placed in that tomb. And so too, her heart remained with the lifeless body of her son. She who had pondered in her heart these mysteries, who had, who had been with him from the start, she who had full trust in him. Though she had grief unlike any other, she also had joy, for she knew that her son would not die again, but would live forever. So some joy was mingled with her sorrow. She had no doubt in the resurrection, for she knew her, her, who her son was. We too should hold the disposition of Our Lady. She who held deep sorrow for the death of her son, yet she looked forward to Easter Sunday. Never fear to draw near to Our Lady, for no one can draw nearer than him who was in her very womb. Her only desire is to point towards her son and say, do whatever he tells you. I opened with a poem, so let me leave you with a poem. I came across this poem to whose author I could not find, yet it speaks truth to our relation to the cross. Little headaches, little heartaches, little griefs of every day, little trials and vexations, how they throng around our way. One great cross, immense and heavy, so it seems to our weak will, might be born with resignation, but these many small ones kill. Yet all life is formed of small things. Little, little leaves make up the trees. Many tiny drops of water, blending, make the mighty seas. Let us not then, by impatience, mar the beauty of the whole. But for love of Jesus bear all in the silence of our soul, asking him for grace sufficient to sustain us through each loss and to treasure each small offering as a splinter from his cross. In nomine Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti, Ave Maria, Gratia Plena, Dominus Tecum, Benedicta tu in mulieribus, and benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. <laughs>